One of the things that we'll be interested in tracking as we look at change processes is going to be the temperature dependence of some of the quantities that we're measuring. Now, I'll remind you that in the very first uh, class for this course, we came up with an expression that indicated that the average value of the kinetic energy for a system of gas particles was equal to 3 halves times the gas constant times the temperature. Okay, we could also write this as 3 halves times the number of particles times Kb, the Boltzmann constant, times the temperature. But however we wish to write it, the essence here is that this energy is a function of the temperature. And in fact, we're going to relate this energy to the internal energy. So it is in fact a function of temperature. Um, the fact that we can take any sort of change process and as long as the temperature changes write that delta U is equal to CV times delta T is also an indication that for an ideal gas anyway the internal energy is solely a function of the temperature. So would this be also true for uh, something like the enthalpy? Well in order to get at that question we want to consider that when we are at constant pressure, all right, we have the case where the uh, the heat change, the incremental heat change that happens at this, is going to be in a, in essence a heat capacity times a change in temperature, just as we found for internal energy. But in this case, since our constraint is constant pressure, we're going to need a different sort of heat capacity. So we're going to write this incremental change of heat at constant pressure as C sub P times dt. So this heat capacity at constant pressure is not necessarily the same as the heat capacity at constant volume. And in fact we'll explore a little bit about that difference for ideal gases in just a moment. But um, this is going to be, uh, when we deal with a process that happens under constant pressure, this is going to be actually the heat capacity that matters the most. The constant volume heat capacity is one that would uh, be the most important if we were looking at a process in which the volume was constrained to remain fixed. Now when we talked about the heat capacity at constant volume, we related it at the time to a change in heat at constant volume divided by an incremental or differential change in temperature. And since the, cha in the incremental change in heat was equal to the internal energy, it meant that we could write something like this, where the differential of the internal energy over a differential in temperature measured at constant volume was simply this uh, heat capacity at constant volume. Well, because of this relationship, we can similarly write that the uh, heat capacity at constant pressure will be the incremental heat change at constant pressure divided by the differential of temperature and that because of its relationship with dh we can now write this as a differential of the enthalpy over a differential of temperature measured at constant pressure. So we have these, uh, these things that are, are parallels, if you will, between internal energy and enthalpy and those parallels are entirely due to um, tracking whether a process is taking place at constant volume or constant pressure. Of course, if it's not taking place at constant either, then we'll have a different thing altogether. But these are the ones that will be the most common in terms of our experience. Now, if I want to consider what the change of enthalpy is, that would just be the heat expressed at constant pressure. And I could write this by integrating this relationship up here so I would write as uh, change from state 1 to state 2 of the heat capacity at constant pressure, dt. This state 1 and state 2 is really two different temperatures. So in effect, what this amounts to is an integral from T1 to T2 of the heat capacity at constant pressure, dt. And if that heat capacity at constant pressure turns out to be constant, we can write it like this as just 
cp times delta t. So this raises the question though, is cp constant? We might also ask the same thing about uh, heat capacity at constant volume. Well, uh, in order to try and answer this question, let me show you a graph of if uh, one did some careful experiments and measured enthalpy change um, as temperature increased. So I'm going to draw temperature as the horizontal axis, and I'm going to draw enthalpy in some form as the vertical axis. Now I'm going to draw this in a color to make it stand out. But let's say we start off down here, we would find that enthalpy slowly rises. Okay, well, this equation here indicates that as temperature increases, as temperature increases, the enthalpy will increase also. All right, we'll get to a point, however, where we'll see a jump in the enthalpy. And I'll talk about what this means in just a minute. All right, when we get beyond this temperature, however, we'll see that enthalpy will once again change in a fashion that looks very much like our equation written here. It'll reach another point in temperature where it again will make a jump and it will again increase from there. So what's going on at these jumps? Well, if I told you that in fact here what we have is a solid, here we have a liquid, and here we have a gas or a vapor, then you know what's happening at these jumps. These are places where we are making a phase transition from solid to liquid when we go from here to here, or from liquid to gas when we go from here to here. These increments that the enthalpy jumps is something called the latent enthalpy. I'll just call that latent H. And it's in this case, it's the latent H of vaporization. So, in other words, when we're going to make this jump from a liquid to a gas, there is a, an enthalpy change that's involved with that associate, that's associated, I should say, with that transition from liquid to gas. Similarly, down here, this is an enthalpy change, I'll we'll call it delta H, that is related to something for fusion or melting. All right. We'll be talking a lot more about these things when we get to Module 4, but it's useful to know about them for now. Now, let me talk a little bit about what's happening in between these jumps, okay? Because that's, that's where we're going to live most of the time. All right. When we're in between these jumps, we see that there is a gradual increase in our enthalpy content. And that gradual increase reflects the value of CP. In other words, if this were a line, if this were a line going up here, that line would have a slope that's equal to the heat, con uh, heat capacity at constant pressure. All right, because remember, heat capacity at constant pressure is just the derivative of the enthalpy with respect to the temperature measured at constant pressure. So the derivative of the enthalpy over the temperature gives us the slope or the heat capacity. Now it turns out that these intervals are not perfect lines. In fact, if I were to draw a perfect line here, that would have a, it's not a very perfect line, sorry. If I were to draw a perfect line, it would have the same slope throughout, but it turns out that what we find is that the enthalpy actually increases a little bit faster than that slope. So in fact, this quantity, the heat capacity at constant pressure, is itself a function of temperature. And uh, this has been uh, studied a lot in experiments, and what we find is that it's possible to model this as a constant time plus another constant times temperature plus a third constant over temperature squared. It's kind of an odd function um, when you really think about it. And in this case, what I'm modeling for you is not just any heat capacity at constant pressure, but the molar heat capacity at constant pressure. And I'm going to indicate that by putting a line over the heat capacity sign here. So molar heat capacity is given by this function where these three constants here are tabulated for a number of different substances. 
So in other words, you can find out how the heat capacity varies for a given substance if you can find uh, the report of that experiment that uh, indicated how it was changing. This is also true, by the way, for the heat capacity at constant volume, but we hadn't talked about it at that point. So what we find in general is that this heat capacity does increase slightly as the temperature increases, although you can see from the way I've drawn this, and that's uh, pretty reasonably accurate, that it is a fairly good constant. The slope is fairly constant uh, you know, for some time. Now I want to close this by talking about a, a specific instance where I'm going to compare the heat capacities at constant volume and constant pressure. But in order to do that, I want to look at in particular an ideal gas. So what I have to say, what, what follows is only going to be relevant for a ideal gas. All right, well, at constant pressure, I can relate the heat change to the enthalpy, uh, the differential enthalpy. That's true for anything, including an ideal gas. And I can write the definition of enthalpy this way. This is the differential of U plus PV. And then I can further separate this out as equal to the differential of U plus the differential of the product, PV. I'm not assuming constant pressure or constant volume in this. But remember that PV is equal to RT. So if I take the differential of PV, that's the same as taking the differential of RT. R is a constant, so that's just R times the differential of dt. All right, and we're going to use this in just a moment. All right, so now when I write all this out, I've got delta of QP, okay, which I can also write up here as CP dt is equal to du, but du, in fact, is equal to CV dt. And I have this differential of PV, which I can write as R dt. Uh, I've done that a little bit quickly, but I ask you to, to look at this at your leisure and convince yourself that it's true for an ideal gas. I've used the ideal gas equation of state here, which is why this expression is only true for an ideal gas. But we'll notice by equating all of these terms that multiply dt, I end up with the expression Cp is equal to Cv plus R, the ideal gas constant. And this, in fact, is true for ideal gases, that the uh, two heat capacities, heat capacity at constant volume and heat capacity at constant pressure, are differ from one another by this gas constant R. And notice that always we have Cp is greater than Cv for these ideal gases. This is also true in general. However, I, I want to caution you about this. I've been very careful to say this is only true for an ideal gas. And in fact, if we were to talk about solids or liquids, in those cases, the constant volume heat capacity and the constant pressure heat capacity are, are virtually the same. They're very close to one another. So we're only going to see a major difference when we're talking about systems of gases. And, and it's, I think, important for you to know that. However, Cp is always going to be generally a little bit greater than Cv because it's going to include some contribution from expansion that we can't get when we have a constant volume process.